stepping stones, number nine. And um, we are quickly getting to the end of how many classes we will be able to do on this one because we've already missed quite a few. Right now we are, if you have your book, we're on chapter five, which is page 39. <clears throat> and uh, the testing of God. <clears throat> And we have uh, Abraham, for an example. Uh, in the book. We have Abraham, for an example, in the book. Um, but we're going to look at several different scriptures. And, and the purpose of the book is hopefully that you'll read it. Because there is, in all of these chapters that I am teaching over the top of, there's really a lot of scriptures and a lot of different angles throughout. So please, for your own sake, um, you know, study it because there will be a test. God will be testing you with this information. And if you fail, it will be worse than making an F. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> let's turn to, uh, let's see, let's go to the book of Job, chapter 23 first. Book of Job. I know some of you needed Job. Like you need a hole in the head. Job 23 and verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath, and my, my version says, tested me, I shall come forth as gold. All right. So one of the things that you, you begin to realize when it comes to the testing of God, <clears throat> and remember, we're, we're putting this in a, a field of other troubles and trials, giving them specific names like chastisement, which is one thing, sufferings of Christ, which is a completely different thing. <clears throat> now we're on the testing of God, and pretty soon we'll be on the test, the trying of Satan, uh, the tempting of Satan. And <clears throat> I have had many a student come up to me and go, how do I know which one I'm going through? You know what I mean? It's, I, just, I just thought just stuff happened, bad stuff. You know, <clears throat> when in reality, there's these things are very ordered, and uh, Lord willing, we'll get to the chapter that sort of. In fact, I think it's entitled "Order Out of Confusion," where there's a chart, and it begins to show you from whom the different ones come from, and scriptures, and different things like that. <clears throat> All right, so we're on the testing of God, and and the first thing that we see here from Job is that. Um, uh, that God is testing his way. His way. <clears throat> well, that's different because most of the time we think God's testing some specific thing. Like, you know, your faithfulness or something in that sense. In that sense. <clears throat> but he's testing the way in which you are faithful or you are this or that or whatever. <clears throat> and so, uh, but there's more. And so let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. Bless you, bless you, and if you sneeze again, bless you again. Manifold blessings upon thee. 1 <clears throat> Peter. Chapter 1. Versículo siete. Uh -huh, that's right. First Peter, capítulo uno, versículo siete. Verse seven. <clears throat> that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, 
might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> all right. Now all I have to do is there they are. <clears throat> all right. This, is, uh, this has got some good stuff right here. That there is a trial or a testing of your faith. If you will, you could say in a certain sense he's not testing you. He's testing you in relationship to your faith. Okay. <clears throat> so um, faith is a huge part of this, but you have to be careful because the, the term faith has been used from everything from how to get, you know, Cadillacs or BMWs to whatever, you know, uh, how to get stuff, <laughs> how to get stuff. <clears throat> Uh, when, in relation, when in reality it is in relationship to the Lord, faith in the Lord, not faith in the Lord for <laughs> something, but faith in the Lord. This is testing your faith in the Lord. Can you have faith in the Lord for something? Yeah, you can have faith in the Lord for something. But for sure the test in this situation is testing you in relationship to your faith in him. <clears throat> and so uh, this verse starts off, that the trial of your faith, so, th so what does this mean? This means that God may be testing you not over something that's wrong, but trying to find out what's right. Okay? So, <clears throat> You know, we go, oh, no, God's testing me, you know. Well, remember, it is an open book test. <laughs> yeah. um, <clears throat> and we get worried about these things mainly because we don't really know the scripture. And in knowing the scripture, we eventually know the Lord, and then we know how to apply. We see things like this, and we realize that this isn't a scary thing on, on one hand. It is, it is God's desire. I'm going to just say it right at this early stage. I'm going to say it's God's desire that we pass the test. Now, it's obviously more than that, but it's, it's more, well, it's more intricate than that. <clears throat> um, but, but the point of saying it like that is to let you know that it is, it's a desire of his that when he tests, that it, it end up being a good thing. All right, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perish it. All right, so this certain kind of faith to God is really precious, more precious than gold. It is, he is by this wording, I mean, obviously, God made gold. He could have all the gold he wants, you know what I mean? <laughs> so... So you could look at it one way and say, well, that's not very precious because, you know. <clears throat> um, but on the other hand, he's trying to speak to our needs and desires and to show us that your faith to him in the proper way of what faith is about is extremely valuable to him. The trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. <clears throat> All right, so here um, uh, in Job it mentioned that it would come forth as gold. Here it's given you the process of how it, your faith will come forth as gold. Okay, and that process is the fire, the fire. Now that's just, the, in the natural that's true. If you, you know, if you had, uh, if you found some gold in the side of a mountain, <clears throat> it would be rough and it would not look like gold and it would be, um, <clears throat> you know, it would be a mixture of a lot of different elements. <clears throat> and so you take that and you put that in a smelting pot and you, you turn up the fire and you get that fire really hot and when you do, the dross comes to the top and is skimmed off, and the gold is what really comes forth, okay? So, um, I guess I should 
also look at these notes. <coughs> um, so the fire has a purpose, and the purpose of the fire is twofold. Number one, it is to separate the dross from the gold, or what's not Christ in us, separate that and separate Christ unto himself because <clears throat> he doesn't save the draw, dross. And <clears throat> this process in the mind of God is bringing forth gold. Um, though it be tried with fire, uh, <clears throat> might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. All right. <clears throat> There's a couple of ways you could read this. You could read it the way that everybody reads that last part, or you could consider maybe a new approach in the context of what it's talking about here, of fire separating gold. Now, we know that gold represents deity. And so this is trying to bring forth Christ out of us, and it's trying to at the same time separate out that which is not Christ in us. All right. <clears throat> so he's wanting to do this, though it's being tried with fire, that it might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. There's the gold that's appearing. So you're not the gold. <laughs> I'm not the gold. And he starts appearing when the dross begins to be separated away. <clears throat> All right. So, um, and the next verse talks about um, re receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. This isn't, and this is a little thing that I, I, I address ever so often, but, you know, in reality, when you got saved, your soul didn't get saved. People say, well, we got to save souls. But it's not your soul that got saved. It's your spirit that God saved. It is you are spiritually alive. You are made alive spiritually. And the scriptures say, what, is it, what does it say? Uh, um, some scriptures talk about the fact that we're saved. Spiritually, we are saved. And our spirit has been regenerated. Your soul wasn't regenerated. You say, I've been regenerated. What part of you been? What part of you been re regenerated? Well, just the the me part, you know. I'm I'm re no no. Your spirit has been regenerated, <clears throat> and so the scriptures talk about that we are saved. That relates to your spirit. The scriptures talk about being saved. What is that? Well, it's right here in this same book, isn't it? Being, yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> verse 23: Being born again. Being. Anybody see an ing at the end of that word? Being, that's an ongoing process. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, that's, that's us, corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, which is Christ, which happens by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The gold is going to be around forever. <clears throat> All right, so... Receiving the end of your faith is the salvation of your souls as far as your faith in your faith walk. Now, you're not trying to get your body saved right now. Right? I mean, I assume your body will be saved if your spirit is saved and certainly if your soul is, uh, is saved. So the process of the, of the work of the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> he's not, you know, working to dry, try to per se, to get your spirit saved, but he is working on your soul. And the thing that he is trying to do is to get us to the point where Christ will come forth, spirit, soul, and body, that you be sanctified holy. And we've talked about that recently. <clears throat> and so um, this, uh, this fire that, that is there, the only thing that really makes it through the fire that is eternal, that is, um, well, read it over here, uh, that liveth and abideth forever, is the gold. That's what comes through the fire, and that's what remains. All right, well, that's Christ in us. Now, that's Christ physically in our body. So a lot of times when we say Christ in us, we're thinking, I got Jesus in my body. I mean, we would not we, we would never think that. 
thought. That's not our mindset, but it, that's really what we're thinking. Well, I got Jesus in me. He's right over here. He's got, got a little room for him in my heart. I made a little room. There's a little table, and he sits there, and he thinks, you know. Uh, I got Jesus in me. But Jesus in you is more than just, you know, having Jesus in your physical pump, which he's not in your physical pump, by the way, but in your heart of hearts. And he is wants to fill up all things with himself, okay? But he's still in us. He's in me. He's in you. He's never going to do away with your personality. I know you're happy with that. Some of us, we got questions. But anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> we prayed and prayed. You might as well figure it now. He's not going to get rid of that person's personality. <clears throat> and I see a lot of you looking up at me going, yeah. You're the one that we were hoping that was going to happen to. <clears throat> All right. So... Um, what we have to determine then is to, to see clearly is what is fire and what is gold. Um, I don't even think, let me look over here at something just, yeah, First uh, Peter 4.12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to test you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Okay, so we're, we're confused when a trial comes, and I'll tell you why we're confused. We're confused because we've been taught that, you know, God only gives us good things. And if anything bad's happening in our life, it's the devil. It's the devil. And if somebody is causing problems in your life, it's the devil in them. <clears throat> um, but I'm here to tell you that <laughs> in many ways you're worse than the devil. And here's what I mean. Let me give my definition. You look over in places like Romans 7 and whatever, and uh, it talks about all the trials and all the stuff, and when you would do good, you don't do good, and when you do bad, it never mentions the devil. It doesn't even mention the devil. It doesn't bring up the devil. Well, it does, you. <laughs> you know. In other words, you are your worst enemy. And... Um, and this testing and stuff that God is doing, he's not testing to see if the devil's in you. Or if you're, he's not testing you as if some strange thing happened to you. He is working to bring forth the gold that is Christ. He tests you. And, okay, so, so that's what we've said that, that it's Christ. But how does he do that? He does that with fire. Or, the scriptures here call it fiery trials. Fiery trials. <clears throat> Which sort of falls under the category of troubles and trials. <laughs> Which is why we're talking about this. <clears throat> In case you're wondering what the heck's going on up here. <laughs> and so... Um, the fiery trial can be just about anything. It can be just about anything. It is a situation where God will put you into a fiery trial, fire, to get gold. And he'll put you in that situation because he wants his son to come forth out of the fire. Hmm? So... So we look at all these trials and we go, well, it's the devil or it's, you know, it's just Sister Susie or Brother Sam or somebody like that. And we're, you know, and we're just, 
you know, or it's my boss. It's the whole problem here is my boss. Well, you know, if, if that is one of the testings of God, testing your faith, he's testing you to see if Christ is going to come forth out of you. He's putting fire on you, not to destroy you, but to get Jesus. He's not mad at you. He's not punishing you. <laughs> yes. Right. I mean, it really is a hopeful thing. Yes. Yeah. Mallory said that that he, if he's putting fire on you in those in those troubles and trials, he's doing it because he he knows Jesus is in there, and he wants to bring forth Christ more. And let's face it. I mean, if you had a if you had a big old ball of gold that you dug out of the side of a mountain or something like that, but before the fire was applied. Um, that prospector might go, oh my God, this is the biggest gold find of you know anybody of, that's been prospecting these mountains for years and years, and I have hit the mother load. But you know, you may put that in the fire, and it ends up just being this a tiny nugget of gold. Okay, <clears throat> but that's more precious to God than anything you could imagine. We would go, oh, I thought it was this big. That's, that's our general problem. Uh, what, did I, what do I usually call that? I've got a term for it. Uh, made up a long time ago. Uh, actual growth and perceived growth. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Um, we, we have an idea of what we, how good we think we're doing. We think that we're, you know, way up here. This is how much we've grown right here. But in, and that's our perceived growth. Perceived growth. But our actual growth might be like right here. Okay? You see the difference in the two? <laughs> Hope you can see that. <laughs> Not on the board. In you. I hope you can see that. <laughs> um, that there is this reality, and, and here's, here's what happens. We get into trials and stuff, and then we, sometimes we react with things that are not Christ. Anybody ever done that before? Yeah, okay. Praise God, I'm glad to know I'm not the only one. Um, and we react with things, and, and then we start going, I thought I had that down. You know, some area that you thought you really had down, and then, man, you're back there again. You go, I thought I had this down. What's wrong with me? And then we start, and, and so then, we start getting down on ourselves as if we're only this much growth. <laughs> okay? So we then we're perceive we're still perceiving, but we're perceiving less than what's really there. But a lot of times, and I'll just be honest with you, a lot of times the drop from our original perceived growth to where the actual growth is sometimes is a pretty big drop. You know. And uh, Deb, do you have something? Yeah, in 1 Peter 4, verse 12, it starts with the word beloved, and then it talks about the fiery trial, and then, like you said, we misunderstand the trial, or boss may be really mad at us, or God's not mad at us, but it starts off with beloved, and that, to me that's saying, take your place in the beloved. Take your place there in the sun, and not in your perceived growth. Well, if you want to avoid thinking that the trial is strange, probably the best thing to do is, beloved, think not. Just go with the mind of Christ. Go with the word of God, you know. Our mind gets us in so much trouble, you know. Well, and that's, you know, it's our mind that's all involved in this perceived growth as opposed to actual growth and everything. And, and then we get, you know, as I said, when we fail on some front, then we get, you know, down on ourselves, and then we think we're a failure and we're this and that and and the lord's not seeing that there it if there has been some faith there and usually we can't see it as much as he does i mean um i always think of the jesus the example jesus gave when he said um, um you know when you when you gave me a drink of water and when you did this for me and you did that and they said when did we do that for you they weren't even aware, but they were doing it for him. 
And you do things for him that you're not even aware because it, there is life in you and that there is a love and a faith in Jesus that you have. So <clears throat> to me, all of this beating up on ourselves and looking down and being so critical that we, we fall into depression, that is counterproductive to what the Lord's trying to do. To go there is not where the Lord ever intended you to go. I know people, used to, uh, you, you'd correct them, and, and instead of going to the Lord, they end up in the lap of the devil. I mean, I've, I've seen people like that, and you're kind of going, well, that wasn't my purpose, you know what I mean? But it was based on this thing right here. Well, if I'm not with God, I must be with Satan. See? No, not, I don't think so, you know? Um, and... Um, there's a scripture that says something about when, when we think of ourselves, think realistically. That's not the exact word, but it is, you know, to think realistically is to accept where we are and accept that our Father has every intention to bring us into the fullness of Christ. And that's why, as Deb was sharing, that's why he calls us beloved. Beloved. And... If you really think about it, <clears throat> I mean, like in the Old Testament Song of Solomon, what was the name of the groom for the bride there? Beloved. The beloved, yeah. <clears throat> that when he says beloved, he's not just saying he loves you, but maybe he's saying, I'm, I see the beloved in you, that I am reckoning you as one with Christ. <clears throat> I see you as in him, and therefore all that is true in him is true in you. So why are you thinking it's strange? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because because he sees you that way. You're accepted where? In the beloved. That's what it says. In the beloved. He uses those exact words. You're accepted in the beloved. And so there, so there has to come a time in our walk that we begin to change the way we view things. And the, we change the way we view ourselves, and we change the way we view Jesus. And here's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about this reality of being accepted in the beloved, in, in the one that God loves. In, and when he says, beloved to you, think it not strange, he has all confidence that it's Christ in you and that nothing can take you out of his hand. <clears throat> but we don't. We we view ourselves based on this corporal flesh on this earth, and we view Jesus as way up there usually. And so our, so our way of proceeding and our relationship with God is primarily based on how well we are doing down here. And in truth, it's not even how well we're doing. It is how well we perceive we're doing, which is good most of the time, that's what we perceive, and it is bad when something bad happens or we get corrected or something like that. Um, you, you know, David said, you know, talked about being corrected, and he said, you know, it's, it, it is a, what is it, smite me for it'll be a, a sweet something. Um, meaning that to, to truly be corrected so that I may be with the Lord may be an honor. Remember what we talked about before? <clears throat> and especially if, if he's seeing the beloved. Okay, so <clears throat> we have to break with this mentality that it's all about me right here. No. And then we say, well, it's all about Jesus. And then again, we see a physical throne with, you know, that guy there with the beard and stuff, you know. And then we go, oh, Jesus, I love you. Well, you know, he's way more than that, okay? In fact, he's not even that anymore. He's not Jesus of Nazareth anymore. <laughs> he's not. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, okay? And, he's, and, and, and as far as you're concerned, those are titles, as far as you're concerned, he's the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of what you are now. That's his word to you, that that's, you know, you're found in him, not having your own righteousness. See, see we're trying to get rid of our own 
uh, sinfulness. And he says, Paul says, I'm seeking him so I won't have my own righteousness. You know? And um, <clears throat> because whatever righteousness, and see, Paul knew this because when he starts there in uh, Philippians 2 talking about his good works and good thing, you know, what he did and all this stuff, he names off all this stuff. So he appeared more righteous than most people because he did stuff right and he never messed up and he da 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 and all this. And, um, but when he saw Jesus as his righteousness and him in Jesus, you know, it's like, you know, you could see Jesus as your chocolate, you know, like a big vat of liquid chocolate. And you say, oh, I love you, Jesus. But, but he wants to throw you into it, you know what I mean? And swim in there and go, whoo, I really love you now, you know, because he's that sweet to us, and he is on fronts that can't even be imagined or explained by a vat of chocolate. <clears throat> uh, but just trying to get, give us an idea. For, I mean, I'm trying to get you to just consider trying to view your relationship with God outside of this physical body and what's going on around here and this and that and start viewing yourself in him and then having, and you know, the eyes are in the head. So you can't see who you are except you see through his eyes, you know. I mean, you think about a caveman or something, you know, or cave woman, you know. I mean, you know, let's say that there's a caveman, and he's a big old, but he was the king of the cavemen, you know what I mean? And so he grabs this good-looking woman, and you know, but he mistreats her, and get over there, give me this, and she goes, I'm just ugly. I'm so ugly and stuff, you know. Well, she is blind to who she is because they don't have mirrors, right? But she goes down one day to get some water, and she looks in the water, and she goes, who is that good-looking chick there? <laughs> you know, that's pretty good. It's me, you know. Well, those, that's like the eyes of the Lord. You begin to see yourself through his eyes instead of your own eyes, your own failures, your own mindset you know our minds are corrupt you know and that's what peter was saying being born again not of corruptible seed where do you think he learned that from well peter was the one who kept failing god he kept failing and and corrupting and denying him and doing all this stuff and so when he found this new relationship with jesus of oneness with him he said hey i want to be born again of another seed i am corruptible through and through and he was but because he failed so much when he saw jesus he really saw and that he was in him it was like yeah i'll take this this is we need to be born again can you imagine peter running around now talking you know he's going look i'm a mess you know and they go no you're not that bad yes i am but jesus isn't and i'm one with him and you know you can have this too. What a difference that happened to that man. And it can happen to anybody because God's no respecter of persons. And if God put Peter in him and then opened his eyes to that, you are in him and he wants to open your eyes to it. But there has to be more than just, you know, sit in the class and go, okay, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the beloved. You're thrilled, aren't you? You know what I mean? Okay, I'm in the beloved. What does that mean to you? Well, theologically. I know, not theologically. How does it change your outlook? Well, you know, I don't know. I'm still bummed out. About what? That which died already at the cross? Are you still trying to repair what's dead, what's rejected, and then he... And then he gave you his life, which is not rejected, which is forever before the presence of God himself. And, and you're there accepted, but only in the beloved. <clears throat> so when, when he says, beloved, think it not strange, maybe it's a little strange to him to have to explain to the beloved, his son, <laughs> that you're looking at this any other way than 
You've got Jesus in you, and he's going to come forth. And, and here's the other thing. If you, if you fail this test, you don't fail the course. With God, you can retake the test. <laughs> See? And Israel did that a bunch. You can, <laughs> you know, 40 years of it. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, when we begin to um, uh, see these realities, then we understand that the testing of God is not out to get us. It's not to show how bad we are. It's not to show uh, what is not Jesus, but to show what is Jesus. So, okay, so we, get in the, we, we have this perceived growth that we have this much, and then we get in the trial, and we come to a realization that we only have this much, we mourn something that was not lost. We never had it. All of this from this point up, we never had that. We're mourning something that never was true. That's, what's the point of that? Well, I, I, I was, no, you weren't. You need to rejoice in what is true of you with Christ. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord. Well, I will if... If he'd be bigger or something, you know, uh, Jesus is full and complete. Your understanding of him and his, his filling you is not yet complete. <clears throat> All right, so just talking about this testing and, um, and how gold and fire and all that works. You know, in the tabernacle, <clears throat> they had a lot of the furniture, and particularly in the, in the holy place and in the holy of holies, there was um, all the furniture there was either pure gold or it was wood, which represented humanity, covered over with gold. <laughs> and one of the particular pieces of furniture there was the, the golden candlestick. And the golden candlestick was pure gold. But it never, it never says it was pure gold. It says it was pure beaten gold. Okay. And the, that seven branch candlestick represents the church. And you can see that in the book of Revelation, the first couple of chapters where, you know, Jesus originally was in the midst of the seven branch candlestick, which is, you know, the seven branch candlestick didn't have candles. It was hollowed out, seven branches, and it was, they were hollowed out like tubes and oil was put in there, and you lit a wick at the top that drew the oil in, and that's where the light came from. In other words, it wasn't a candle. It was a vessel of oil and light. Okay. And it had seven branches to it. And if you study the book of Revelation there, well, Jesus is in the midst of the seven churches. It's a seven-branch candlestick. It's, the, it's representative of the church. And it's representative of us having Christ in us. But the interesting thing is, is it's pure gold. Now, what does that mean? I mean, what is, what is you know, because that would be, that would represent the Lord. It represents the Lord in us. It represents having gone through a process of fire, and I'll put it like this, beating. Because it was beaten gold. It says that over and over, beaten gold, pure beaten gold. Okay. So this is God, this is deity, this is, this is Christ, the sufferings of Christ, not our sufferings that we fellowship with him because they're similar. They're the sufferings of Christ. They're also, Paul said, bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. This is in the body. This isn't in the spirit or in our theology. This is bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. All of that, all of those attacks, all of that beating, all those sufferings, not your sufferings. They're Christ's. Okay? They're not yours. They're Christ. They, but you're bearing them. <laughs> you are bearing them. And so, and, and if you really think about it, all that gold, I mean, they didn't just find a big clump of gold and beat it into this thing. They found a lot of little pieces of gold with mixture and stuff, and it took time to get the dross out of all the little pieces. And then one day they brought it all together and they did a final purifying. And then they wanted to form it as the church, the body, the bride of Christ. And guess how you form it through that? 
through the fire where the final things go out and you're being brought together as one bride, one body for Christ. And, and he's going to fill the whole thing, right? The seven grand, branch, branch candlestick. He's going to fill every part. And, but, the, but even though it's gone through the fire, it still has to be beaten. Okay? And, you know, a couple of pictures that you get there. One is the one I was just describing. But there's also this other one when you realize that all that gold was beaten gold. And all of that is a picture of God being beaten by man. God being beaten by man. Pure gold being beaten. You know. But now here's the beauty of it. It's being beaten to form his body. Amen. And that Christ will be the thing that is seen. And Christ will fill all and in all. And it's a work of the Holy Spirit, which represents the guy who did all this beautiful work in the Old Testament. Bezalel was his name. And, um, and by the way, that's where the Bezalel curve came from, if you know anything about. Uh, never mind, you don't. I saw your faces. <laughs> but uh, um, it represents the Holy Spirit and his intricate work to form us according to the pattern of Christ, to form us as his body so that we would be fit uh, as one with him. <clears throat> and what, what has happened is whatever gold which is Christ in you and whatever gold which is Christ in you and whatever gold which is Christ in you or you or you, that was all brought together. And there's no thought in his mind of any dross that ever was there. There's no, you know, thinking this thing, you know, this thing's messed up. It's that which is Jesus that draws us together. And it's that which is Jesus that makes us one. And it's that which is Jesus that's going to please the Father. So, what is that? What am I saying? If all of this is true, then all this bunk about us trying harder, thinking we're going to, you know, do the trick, and not, not pressing in with all of our heart, to be conformed to the image of Christ, then we're just spinning our wheels. Hello? We are. You know, he's not going to have an old drossy candlestick, you know what I mean, old clogged up thing. He's not going to do it, and that's us. And so, you know, we can say, well, I, I love the things of this world, so I want to hold on to my dross. <laughs> oh, that's fine. But, you know, that's where, that's where he's going to, you know, work on you. He's going to work on you because you are one with him. You have died. You are raised up as one with him. And he already sees that. And you can say, you can say whatever you want. Your mind can be so contrary to letting this mind be in you. But he said it will be less painful if you let this mind be in you. <laughs> It'll be less painful because you won't be, you know, it's like, you know, here, I'll give it to you. And then he starts telling you, no, no, I'm not ready. You know, anybody ever do that with anything with the Lord? You know, and it's like back and forth, back and forth. And you just go, okay, take it. No, not really. You know, <laughs> and, and, and it's not, you know, <clears throat> the, the deal is not going to happen until Jesus is more important than anything else, you know, that we have. And that doesn't automatically happen when you get saved. We, th we think it does. We think that we're, some Christians, here's the weird thing, and I'll try to end with this. Some Christians think that they were better in the Lord their first couple of years than they are now after 15 years or 20 years or whatever. They think they were better because they were children running around playing with the father's toys. And they go, wee, you know, oh, a miracle, and, you know, and this and that, and it's, oh, you know, God's so good. Yeah, well, you know, the same God is going to take you to the cross in him. No, no, he's not going to do that. This is what everything's supposed to be like. No, the cross really is the form of what everything's supposed to be like, you know. You know, and that can't be. Randy, you're a heretic. Well, I've, I've been called worse, okay? <clears throat> Much worse.
Um, but I can assure you that the Father's heart is patient with us. But if we get way down the road and we are still looking back to what once was, trying to relive those days, then we've missed the point. I mean, the point is, Bezalel, come on, bring your hammer. You know, I want to be conformed to the image of Christ. The Father wants Jesus, not a, a, a flitty little, you know, kid running around just trying to get its way and, and, you know, having fun doing it, which is great when you're two, okay? okay. But, and, you know, I mean, anybody ever wonder why life is the way it is? I mean, why, you know... Why, you know, we have so much fun when we were a kid. Some do. I mean, my life wasn't so great. <laughs> but, you know, some have, you know, they have great memories and all this kind of stuff. And then you get older and you get married and life gets hard and then you have kids and then you do this and, you know, and then you just, you know, you're just miserable. Well, I don't think that you're supposed to be miserable. I think we're missing something. I think we've missed something along the way. You know, uh, well, a lot, lot that I could say. <clears throat> but how, can, how do you tell somebody that, that in their mind they keep wanting to go back? And that's exactly what Israel was doing after they left Egypt. They kept saying, well, let's go back. At least there we had. Yeah. You know? Yeah, you did. But you, and, 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 and here's the deal. One reason why people are so miserable and wonder what happened and keep wanting to go back is as long as you keep hanging around in that wilderness, nothing's fulfilled. You don't get Egypt and you don't get the promised land. It's just, it's just a little no man's land, you know. And it's not fun, and I admit it. And, you know, so, you know, somewhere along the way you go, you know what, I'm sick of this. God, you're trying to take us somewhere. Oh, you you ready to go now? <laughs> uh, God goes. Well, it's, it's only been forty years <laughs> of your going your way. You know, why don't we try mine? Okay. So you know, and they go, okay, good stuff's gonna happen. They get to the Jordan River and it's overflowing its banks. He's going, we're gonna cross the Jordan. They're going, we're all gonna die. <laughs> but thank God they didn't say that. They were ready to enter in. The old had died and the new was there. The old generation, we always look at that as like, well, those people, they just didn't have it. They're the old generation, but we're going to go in. But the old that died was the old us. We're, it's all one generation. And the new generation that went in is us renewed and, and, and filled with Christ and ready to, to, you know, take all that God has for us. You know, so... We're not, you know, I've heard people teach, well, you know, that old generation, they're just not going to move in. So we will. Well, that old generation is you, buddy. <laughs> you know, we all need to die in the wilderness and then come in on the wings of what he says is new concerning us. Jesus said, behold, I make all things new. Two ways of reading that. Either he's a maker or he is what is new. Either he just goes magically, I make it new, you're new, you're new, you're new. Or he says, I make it new. I'm what makes all things new. I'm the newness of life that you receive over in Romans 6. Anyway, that's it. I've had it.